So by now, you're convinced that the problem of taking a polynomial which was irreducible over the rationals and then extending the field of rational numbers in order to locate all of the roots of that polynomial is in general a process that might take more than one step. For a polynomial like t cubed minus 2, we might, a couple of videos ago, have believed that it was enough just to extend using the real cubed root of 2 in order to find all the roots of t cubed minus 2. But we found out that this was not, in fact, a normal extension. It didn't contain all of the roots of this polynomial, even though it contained one of them. And so in order to locate all of the roots of t cubed minus 2, because you notice that two of those three roots are not real, we needed to attach a non-real number to our field. We can do that, it turns out, by adding in the square root of the real number, negative 3. And if I add both of those things into my field, then I can locate all three of the roots of t cubed minus 2, and that makes this a splitting field for the polynomial t cubed minus 2. But we had to do this in two steps. We had to adjoin the real cubed root of 2, and we had to adjoin something that was not real in order to make this polynomial split. In this video, we're going to look more closely at that question of non-reality. In other words, when we have to put non-real numbers into our field in order to split a polynomial, what's the most efficient way to do that? For instance, if I have another irreducible polynomial, like t to the fifth minus 11, what non-real numbers am I going to expect to have to put in to a splitting field for this polynomial? We're going to talk in this video about fields called the cyclotomic fields. And the cyclotomic fields are exactly those fields that contain just enough non-real numbers to make a polynomial of a certain degree split. So for example, for t to the fifth minus 11, the first extension that we might make along the road to finding a splitting field for t to the fifth minus 11 will be to extend to what we're going to call the fifth cyclotomic field. In this video, we're going to get a feel for what those cyclotomic fields are. And in the next video, we'll also take a deeper look at what are the structure of those cyclotomic fields over the rationals. See, the idea of a cyclotomic extension is that we want to throw in just enough non-real numbers in order to split a polynomial of a certain degree. So we need some real numbers in general, non-real numbers, in order to solve polynomial equations. But we don't want to put in too many, because again, we want to get a splitting field, and not just some generic, gigantic field in which our polynomial splits. So what should we do? Here's the motivation behind the cyclotomic fields. Let's take a complex number like 1 plus i. And suppose that we want to include 1 plus i in a number field, in other words, an extension of the rational numbers. Well plotting it in our little complex plane diagram over here, if we have 1 plus i, then because this is a field, then we also have to have all of the powers of 1 plus i. If I take the square of that number, I get 2i. If I take the third power, I get negative 2 plus 2i. If I take the fourth power, I get negative 4, and so on and so on. So we have to include all of these in our number field if we have 1 plus i, because our field is closed under multiplication. But take a look at what's happening to these powers as we get further and further out. Turns out that they keep growing. They spiral away from the origin in the complex plane. So they don't repeat themselves. They grow without bound. And somehow this is not exactly what we want. It might not be the most efficient way to get a 1 plus i in our number field. So OK, if that's not so good, let's try cutting that in half, 1 plus i over 2. Say we want this number in our number field. Then we also have to have its square, which is equal to i over 2. We have to have its cube, which is minus 1 plus i all over 4 we have to have its fourth power, which is negative 1 fourth, and so on and so on. But take a look at what these powers are doing. These powers, instead of growing away from the origin, are actually shrinking in toward the origin without bound. So again, maybe this isn't the most efficient way in order to get 1 plus i over 2 in our number field. So the idea is to take those two examples we just looked at and look for their common threads. So here are 1 plus i and 1 plus i over 2 again. And here are the powers that we just looked at of them. And the first example, those powers were spiraling away from the origin. And the second example, they were spiraling in towards the origin. Can we take these and find out what they have in common in order to maybe find a small, finite set of powers that are enough to include in our number field? Well, take a look at what these powers of alpha have in common with one another. The first powers, alphas, all lie along the same line that makes an angle of 45 degrees, pi over 4, with the x-axis. Likewise with the second powers, they all lie on the vertical axis, the imaginary axis. The third powers all lie on the same ray, originating from the origin. So do the fourth powers, and so on. So if I want to find something that's in common to both, I should maybe use the angles. 
Let's take a look on the unit circle at what complex numbers we might be able to use to stand in place of these. And to find a number on the unit circle that has the same angle as my alphas did, all I have to do is take 1 plus i and divide it by its own complex modulus. The complex modulus of 1 plus i is the square root of 2. So 1 plus i over the square root of 2 is a number on the unit circle. Let's take a look at its powers. Zeta squared is here at the top of the unit circle on the imaginary axis. Zeta cubed is out there at a 135 degree angle. Zeta to the fourth is on the negative real axis. Zeta to the fifth, zeta to the sixth, zeta to the seventh, zeta to the eighth turns out to come back to one. And because zeta to the eighth is equal to one, that means zeta to the ninth is equal to zeta again. Zeta to the tenth is the same as zeta squared. Zeta to the eleventh is the same as zeta to the third, and so on and so on. And this keeps going around. So what we find out is if we start with one of these zetas on the unit circle, then the set of all of its powers satisfies this criterion, that if n and m are congruent mod 8 in this case, then the nth power and the mth power of this zeta are equal one to another. In other words, we've taken what used to be infinitely many different powers and now collapsed it to just eight different powers indexed by the residues modulo 8. So the observation is that since we have to have all powers of zeta if we want zeta in our number field, we better make it so that there are as few of those as possible if we want to make the simplest possible extension that includes our non-real numbers. But in this example, the set of all powers of this particular zeta, 1 plus i over radical 2, is a finite set consisting of only plus or minus 1, plus and minus i, and then plus and minus 1 plus and minus i over radical 2, and also plus and minus 1 minus and plus i over radical 2. In other words, just those eight points lying at the vertices of a regular octagon on the unit circle is the set of all possible powers of zeta. That's a finite set in the complex numbers. Not only that, because it's the set of powers of the same zeta, it's actually closed under multiplication. If I multiply two powers of zeta, I end up getting another power of zeta. And therefore, not only is it a finite set in the complex numbers, it's a finite subgroup in the group of non-zero complex numbers under multiplication. So that's kind of cool. So what is this zeta? This zeta is a root of the polynomial t to the eighth minus one. Why? Because zeta to the eighth is equal to one. Not only that, it has eight distinct powers. Zeta to the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth are all different complex numbers. They're the ones around the unit circle. And that actually makes it something that we call a primitive eighth root of unity. It's an eighth root of the number one because t to the eighth is equal to one. But also it's primitive because it generates all of the other numbers which satisfy t to the eighth is equal to one. And in general, in a different video, we saw that we can write a primitive nth root of unity as e to the two pi i over n. So in this example, n is equal to eight. And this zeta eight is e to the two pi i over eight. Or if you like, e to the pi i over four. So here's our definition on what this looks like in a more general situation. The kth cyclotomic field is the result of taking the rational numbers and then throwing in a kth root of unity, a primitive kth root of unity. So it's the extension of the rational numbers by the primitive kth root of unity. In other words, to write the kth cyclotomic field, all we'll do is write q adjoined with zeta k, where zeta k is e to the 2 pi i over k. But in order to understand these cyclotomic fields a little bit better, we need also to know what is a minimal polynomial for zeta k over the rationals. After all, knowing a minimal polynomial gives us a lot of information on the structure of an extended field. So that's also a definition. We're going to define the kth cyclotomic polynomial to be the minimal polynomial for zeta k over the rational numbers. So let's do some exploration and figure out what some of these kth cyclotomic fields and cyclotomic polynomials look like, beginning with the example from the previous slide where k was equal to 8 and the eighth uh, root of unity, the primitive eighth, primitive eighth root of unity, 1 plus i over radical 2, which is the same, if you like, as radical 2 over 2 plus i times the same. And all those eighth roots of unity are, again, arranged in a regular octagon uh, inscribed in the unit circle in the complex plane. Now, what does a generic element of the eighth cyclotomic field look like? Well, it has to have the rationals in it, a times 1. And it also has to have all of the powers of this zeta 8 in it. And in principle, we could have a different coefficient for each of those powers. But the second power is equal to i. 
And the third power is minus root two over two plus i radical two over two. The next power is negative one, and so on and so on. So if we write out all of the eight powers of zeta eight, what we find out is that we actually don't need quite as much as we might think in order to capture every element in this field. What's the least that we should have to adjoin to q in order to get all of these elements? We'll take a look at what they have in common. Each one of them has a radical two in it, perhaps, or it might have an i by itself, and maybe that's enough. Maybe just having radical two and i in our field is enough to give us all of these eighth roots of unity. And you might ask, well, could we do even better? What about square root of negative two? Well, because we need square root of two by itself in our field, we can observe that square root of two, because it's equal to the sum of the first and seventh powers of zeta eight, actually doesn't belong to q adjoin the square root of negative two. So just adjoining the square root of negative two isn't enough, but it looks like adjoining i and the square root of positive two is enough to give us the eighth cyclotomic field. And so we might conjecture that the eighth cyclotomic field is in fact isomorphic to the extension of q by just i and the square root of positive two. Now what's a minimal polynomial? In other words, the eighth cyclotomic polynomial that describes this as an extension over q. Well, what's the basis for q adjoint i radical two? That basis has four elements in it. One i square root of two and i square root of two. Those are all rationally independent. And therefore, the eighth cyclotomic field is actually a fourth degree extension, a quartic extension of the rationals. Which means that when we go to find a minimal polynomial for zeta eight over q, that minimal polynomial should be a quartic. Well, what quartic? First and foremost, we know that zeta eight is gonna satisfy t to the eighth minus one is equal to zero. This is where the story of every cyclotomic polynomial begins. But because we need this to be a minimal polynomial, we don't just stop here. Because even though this is monic, and zeta eight is a root of it, it is not yet irreducible. So we have to factor this as much as we possibly can and identify the smallest irreducible factor of which zeta eight is a root. We can begin factoring t to the eighth minus one just by bringing out a factor of t to the fourth plus one, t to the fourth minus one. In other words, factoring it as a difference of two squares. Then t to the fourth minus one can be factored as a difference of two squares. And then t squared minus one can be factored as a difference of two squares. So we end up with all four of these factors. We can show that each one of these four factors is in fact irreducible. Now to figure out which one of them we should select as the minimal polynomial for zeta eight, let's just take a look at what are the roots of the various factors that we wrote down here. Well obviously t minus one has a root of one, and that's not zeta eight, so we're gonna eliminate that one. t plus one has a root of negative one, which is not zeta eight, so we can eliminate that one as well. t squared plus one has the roots plus or minus i, which again is not zeta eight. Zeta eight is one of these that are in between. So having ruled out the last three irreducible factors, the irreducible polynomial, which is now the minimal polynomial for zeta eight, and therefore the eighth cyclotomic polynomial, is the polynomial t to the fourth plus one. And as advertised, because the minimal polynomial for zeta eight is t to the fourth plus one, that also shows us that the eighth cyclotomic field is a degree four extension of the rationals. So what's interesting that we're gonna see in the next video is that the story is not the same for all of the different cyclotomic fields. Starting with the cyclotomic field where k is equal to eight actually gave us kind of a complex example. It turns out that the examples will be simpler depending on the reducibility properties of the number k. In other words, we're gonna get a different story for prime values of k than we've gotten for composite values of k. And that's the story we'll see in the next video in greater detail.